Well, hello, everybody. I hope that everyone can see us uh, OK today. We are having a little bit of trouble with the internet. I am in Santa Rosa, California, and uh, at the resort. And the internet connection is sometimes drops. So if it drops, um, just be patient with us. I will try to log back on, and we'll take it from there. And in the worst case scenario, we will reschedule the webinar for a later time. But uh, to save time today, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. McDougall and uh, thank him for taking the time. It is a very busy weekend. Dr. McDougall. Okay, well, Gustavo, thank you. I mean, I know it's hard traveling all the way from Texas out here to Santa Rosa, California. And to, um, well, you know, it's a nice hotel, the Flamingo Resort is. Uh, we've been there for since yeah. uh, 2002. So this would be almost 13 years we've been re running our program there. And this weekend we have uh, something called the Advanced Study Weekend, which is, uh, you know, an amazing event. We have about 250 people live, maybe 300, and about 500 who watch by the internet. And by the way, any of you who want to watch this weekend almost live by the internet, uh, you can go to the website and sign in for the weekend. It does cost; it's not free, but it's well worth it. It's uh, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We have uh, Kim Williams, who is the President of the American College of Cardiology. Uh, he'll be speaking tonight as our, uh, our introductory speaker. Dan Butner from the Blue Zones will be with us this weekend. Uh, Chef AJ will be there. Uh, all, ki all kinds of great people are going to be there this weekend. So you can still attend uh, as, a, um, uh, as an internet viewer. I, I suppose uh, it, there may be even a hotel room or two left at the Flamingo Resort. Anyway, this is the September 11th. We're talking about 2015, uh, this event. Uh, so if you're watching this later on, you may have missed it. Uh, these are called the Advanced Study Weekends, which, by the way, kind of fool people because they think you have to have attended the 10-day live-in program or be some kind of expert in nutrition to uh, attend these weekends. Uh, they're advanced study because they bring in new ideas. We bring in people from... Uh, uh, from all around the world who don't believe exactly like I do. I mean, they're not just uh, totally off-base people, but they have different ideas. Very few of them are vegan, vegetarian. Uh, they bring in um, ideas about how to protect yourself as a, as a customer, as, as a patient. Uh, they do bring in other ideas about nutrition. Most of the time, they support what we believe. As I say, not exactly, not exactly vegan. So people arrive at these advanced study weekends, they go, oh my goodness, they're not, they're not teaching the McDougal diet. Well, no. You know, if you want to uh, uh, attend an event that's just about the McDougal diet, we have those a couple times of the year. This is advanced study. This is where we bring in new opinions. Enough about that. I was going to talk to you a little bit about today, just to start out, about weight loss. First of all, the, the thing that uh, if you don't know me, you plan to get to know me a little bit better. The first thing I'd like to clarify is that I am not a weight loss doctor. That was never my intention to be a weight loss doctor. I'm a board certified internist. I uh, take care of high blood pressure, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, coronary artery disease, constipation, etc. cetera. Uh, it's just that almost all my patients are overweight. I mean, that's, that's the obvious. Uh, Two thirds of people are overweight in the United States. A third of the children are obese or overweight. So it just kind of comes with the territory. You get a lot of people who are overweight. They're, they're fat. They don't know why they're fat. They don't know what to do about it. And probably the most rewarding thing about changing their diet for most people is the fact that they lose the excess weight. Um, let's see. It was about, about over 20 years ago, uh, my, uh, my following, so to speak, asked me if I'd write a book about weight loss. And it was the McDougal program for maximum weight loss that I wrote about 20 years ago. It's still it's still for sale. Uh, bookstores all over the country. You, you can get it any place in the world through your bookstore. It's uh, it's a big back seller for Penguin Putnam uh, Company. And uh, it's done well. It was never my intention. So I kind of got into the weight loss business which is what we talked about last week, and we're going to talk a little bit about this week. <clears throat> uh, as I see it, there's a reason people are overweight. And that reason is not God-given. It's not because, it's not because our, our creator, Mother Nature, 
whatever, uh, made a mistake and designed us with the wrong hunger drive or the wrong size stomach or the wrong brain. Uh, the reason people are overweight, as we started to talk about last week, is because they choose the wrong kinds of foods. And if you choose the right kinds of foods, then your appetite works right, your stomach works right, etc. Well, most people never get around to that conclusion. They just say, well, I'm fat because uh, uh, it's genetic, or I eat too much. I love that one. I eat too much. Well, how could you eat too much? Your hunger drive can't be wrong. Your stomach can't be the wrong size. But that's what they conclude. I eat too much. I got to eat less. And that doesn't work because that hurts. So, uh, look, no, let's just say it. most people are in this dilemma where they're overweight. They can't lose weight, at least on a permanent basis. They've tried dozens of times, if, if not more, to lose weight. And uh, they look for every possibility. The newest possibilities involve uh, uh, weight loss surgery, bariatric surgery, which we're, I don't know, maybe we may touch on that a little bit today. But uh, <clears throat> the usual possibilities, the usual ways people deal with weight are, number one, as I mentioned, they try to be hungry. They try to stop eating. Doesn't work. The hunger drive is too powerful. It's there to keep you alive. The second most common method people use to cause themselves to lose weight is to make themselves sick. When you're sick, you don't eat, your appetite goes away. It's natural. When you're sick, you're not supposed to be gathering food. You're supposed to be recuperating. So one of the natural side effects of being ill is to lose weight. Well, you can artificially induce illness in yourself by choosing very bizarre foods, the extreme, the extreme in, in, in foods. And these are the low carb diets. Carbohydrate is made by plants. So these are our diets that virtually eliminate plants. Uh, there are no carbohydrates in uh, meat, poultry, you know, pig, cow, fish, no carbohydrate. There's a little bit of carbohydrate in milk. Uh, there's almost no carbohydrate in cheese. So what people do is they go on the bacon, butter, and brie diet. You know what the bacon, butter, and brie diet is? I mean, some of you have been in the dieting world long enough to know what bacon, butter, and brie is associated with. Robert Atkins, the Atkins diet. Uh, that diet was uh, popular in the 70s when I was uh, first getting into uh, medicine back in the 70s. Uh, it was very popular for a while, and then people figured out that bacon, butter, and brie would give you a heart attack and a stroke and cancer. And so it kind of disappeared for a while, and then it came, and I thought it would be gone forever. Let me, <coughs> <coughs> Let me tell you this, uh, uh, this little story. Uh, the, um, the Atkins-type diet, the low-carb diets, virtually disappeared back in the, uh, uh, about the 19, late 1980s, virtually disappeared. Uh, I was writing books. I was quite popular with my books back in the uh, uh, mid and late 80s. And then in the early 90s, my publishers came to me and they said, McDougall, we want you to uh, stop writing books that are based on plants, high carbohydrate diet books. We want you to instead, we want you to write a low carb book because we believe the low carb diets are coming back. Now, this is, this is the early 90s. We believe they're coming back. And I was making a lot of money for Penguin Putnam. I, I talked to my editor and I said to her, I said, that's crazy. The low carb diets will never come back. Everybody knows they're dangerous. No, that's never going to happen. And they said, yeah, you're going to have to start writing low carb diet books. And I said, well, look, wait a minute. I don't just do this for money. I do this because I believe in it. I'm not going to write a low carbohydrate diet book. And they said, okay. Well, you know what? They were right and I was wrong. The low carbohydrate diet books, including Robert Atkins, came back with a huge revenge. And uh, they continue to be popular. Even though, you know, even though uh, most doctors still know, most scientists still know, most research papers still tell that these diets that are made of meat, meat, will give you disease. At the very least, they'll give you constipation. You know, at the very most, they'll rot your arteries and give you cancer. 
but they still remain. Now, I did a, just to, just to give you a little story on this, I, I, I was invited in the year 2000 to uh, Washington, D.C. <clears throat> to do the great debate. It's still on the internet. The great debate in front of the USDA. And uh, that was a debate between the low carbers and the high carbers. I was there, Dean Arnish was there, um, Robert Atkins was there. Uh, we, we did this debate in front of, oh, it must have been 150 cameras and about 500 people from in front of the USDA. And uh, you know, I told them right, right there in, in the public, I said, this, this is never gonna go. And, and uh, one of the dietitians was, well, that was there said, Robert Atkins, if you think your diet is so good, how come there's no research showing it's good? This is in the year 2000. <clears throat> and I kind of took Robert Atkins off, uh, off, uh, off guard there. And he says, I, I know he thought to himself, well, you know, you're right, there hasn't been any research done. So what happened right after that in the year 2000 is he went and he hired a bunch of researchers. Uh, and they started doing scientific studies on the Atkins diet. I wrote a, a big piece on this, on, on the scientific research that was done, say, over the, the next five or six years. And what they did is they, uh, is they rigged it. They rigged the research to show that they'd get some good results. <coughs> Excuse me. The research did show that people lost weight. It showed that their bad cholesterol went up. The research also showed that people had bad breath. About 70% of people had bad breath and about 70% of the people were constipated. But they lost weight. And then some of the studies started coming out comparing low carbohydrate, in other words, these meat-based diets, and high carbohydrate diets. So they said, low fat, they called them low fat. They said, well, we'll do studies comparing uh, our uh, Atkins kind of diet to a uh, high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Well, what they did is they rigged it again. They rigged it again. They compared these low-carb diets to diets that were 30% fat, not 7% fat like I teach or Ornish or Pritikin or Neil Bernard or Esselstyn, uh, you know, not, not diets that are naturally low in fat. I mean, potatoes are 1% fat, rice is 5% fat. You know, corn's about 9% fat. No, no, they, they used 30% fat diets and actually the fat content of the diets were very similar that they compared. Anyway, there's continues to be research. The Atkins Foundation funds it. And uh, the, there's continues to be research out there that shows that these low carbohydrate diets are the best diets. But if you read the research carefully, you see that they're rigged. And uh, you know, e even if, just, just to stop for a minute, I'll, I'll get on to an, another phase of this. Even if it were true that a low carb diet, diet based on bacon, butter, and brie, the Atkins kind of diet, even if it did cause you to lose weight permanently. Doesn't have a good record. Even if it did reduce your risk of dying of heart disease, and by the way, Robert Atkins had terrible atherosclerosis, which he never admitted publicly, but afterwards his uh, widow put on their website uh, results of his angiograms, which showed he had terrible atherosclerosis as well as horrible heart failure. So, but even if it did, reduce your risk of heart disease and cancer and so on. There's just one other card that has to be played, and I want everybody to think about it for a minute. These kinds of meal plans are uh, destroying planet Earth. They're the, major con they're the major controllable contributor, eating the kind of foods recommended on this diet, the major controllable contributor to greenhouse gases, to global warming. So even if, if it was true that that this kind of eating was the best for people, which it's not. <clears throat> There's a moral issue here. And that is that we're eating the planet to death by eating the cows and the pigs and the chicken. You know, cows are one of the most destructive things on the planet. Uh, eating all the fish in the ocean. All right, done with that, I just wanna say one more thing. And then, then we can open for some questions. And I'm glad, Gustavo, that we've uh, maintained this internet connection so far. Everybody realizes we're having a little problem here. The way these low carb diets work, these, these are diets, again, bacon, butter, brie, fish. The way these diets work is when you go on them, you're not eating any carbohydrates. So what the body does first, because it requires carbohydrate, is it takes uh, carbohydrate from its own tissues, from the liver, 
from the muscles. It's called glycogen. We store about two, three pounds of glycogen in our system. Associated with that glycogen, each molecule of glycogen are a couple of molecules of water. So when you use up your glycogen store, say two or three pounds of glycogen, you use up another six pounds of water. So you go on these diets and you're, you're on day five or six, and you go, my goodness, I lost six, eight, 10 pounds. And you're thrilled. Well, that phase is over. You've lost the water weight. Then what happens is you go into ketosis, which is the condition that occurs when you're sick or starving. Your body burns fat, produces ketones. One of the side effects of ketones, ketosis, is you lose your appetite. So you lose your appetite and you continue to lose weight, but you can only stay sick for so long. Now, I have to say, uh, when I met Robert Atkins at the USDA Great Nutrition Debate in 2000, he was fat. Yes, he was. And, and you know, I, I know some of you don't appreciate the fact that I get so direct about things. When he died, he was my age. Uh, he, said, he, was, he was said to have died from a fall. We don't need to get into that. Uh, but let's just say he died. He was taken to the autopsy lab. He was examined. His medical report stayed hidden for about a year and a half. Then his medical report came out and showed that he was about 60 pounds overweight uh, and in and, and pretty poor condition. You can read about that. You know, I've made a big point about this over, over the years and recently is that when people are recommending a diet, you ought to look at the recommender. You know, as uh, George Bush used to say, I'm the decider. Well, you ought to look at the recommender. And I tell you, these people who recommend low carb diets, Robert Atkins, fat. Barry Sears, the zone, fat. Lauren Cordain, the paleo diet, fat and sick looking. Sally Fallon from Western Price, fat. I mean, it goes on and on. These people look like what they eat. They look horrible. Anyway, it's not a sustainable diet, not for people or for the planet. These low carb diets aren't. Let me end by saying there must be a diet for people. There must be a diet that allows us to look, feel, and function our best. Obesity used to be rare. You, know, you look at pictures of people of the past. There are no fat people. What were they living on? They were living on starch, a diet of rice, Asians. When I say, when I say rice, you think Asians, you think thin people from Vietnam, China. Oh, but that was before. That was before 30 years ago. That's all changed now that they've given up their rice and started eating the meat. There is a diet, the diet that keeps you trim and active and functional. It's been the diet that people have eaten, documented for maybe two and a half million years, maybe, certainly over 100,000 years. It's a diet of starch, rice, corn, potatoes, other kinds of grains, with fruits and vegetables. People did eat, you know, they weren't vegan. They did eat animal, they ate anything they could get their hands on just to stay alive. But animal foods, these low carb foods were, were rare in people's diets. And, and that's the secret. If you're tired of being hungry, which hurts, if you're tired of being sick, which hurts, <laughs> if you want to get your life back in order, lower your cholesterol, get your bowel, bowel movements working, uh, there is a way to do it. And I know most of you listening know what that is. You need a diet of rice and or potatoes and or beans and or sweet potatoes. And then you become most functional, lowest cholesterol, cleanest arteries, least chance of cancer. It, 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 it works like it should work. Gustavo, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I went far longer than I expected, and the Internet has been far kinder than we expected. Yes. Okay. I am very grateful at this moment. Uh, Dr. McDougall, people are very grateful. They're all saying here how much they appreciate these webinars. And um, uh, let's get one question out of the way if you, if you wish to answer it. There's a person that is asking, how tall are you? Well, I, I, I used to be six feet. <laughs> you know how they say, I, I'm almost, let's see, I'm 68 years old. I haven't measured my height in a while, but I used to be six feet. 
I am fewer than 150 pounds. I, I can tell you that for sure. I put the scale right here and stand <laughs> uh, fewer than 150 pounds. Good. Um, but th there were times in my life when I was a little heavier. If you search back, you'll find that there are times when I weighed about 20 pounds more than I did. And you know what? I know why. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a mystery or a violation of what McDougall knows to be true. Uh, in those days when I used to be a book salesman, travel around the country selling books, which I did for about 15 years, and um, I did some eating and some drinking that I shouldn't have done, and it showed. Uh, but anyway, that, that's my height. My cholesterol, my cholesterol, if you want to know that, my uh, last cholesterol I got was 137, but I have had cholesterols over 300. I also had a major stroke, and any of you know that. That was when I was 18. I am now 68. I didn't, don't want to have another one of those. Yeah, no. I would. You mentioned something just now that, that that you brought up that someone had asked a question about, and is that um, you mentioned that at some point in your life you had either reached a plateau or you had uh, you were a little bit heavier. And this person is asking, what 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 are the key weaknesses, and how uh, did you overcome that to get back to being trim? Well, as I say, I I know why I was overweight. I had to eat in restaurants. And they always, you know, you always, they always put oil in restaurants. We'll do it. Yes. Yeah, they, they always do that. And, and you know, uh, believe it or not, uh, I, don't, I don't wear a halo. I mean, I probably eat better than most of you think I do. But there have been times in the past when there was a favor of this or that. And I'm not going to, this is not confession, folks. I'm not going to confess. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the, the reasons that I, I had the problems I had were because of what I did. Right. Uh, uh, all I had to do was to believe in what Dr. McDougall says is true and to do it. And, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, as I've, uh, you know, it's, it's easier now. Life is a little easier because I spend more of my time at home and Mary and I eat simpler foods. I, I'll tell you, when people come to me and they come to me all the time, Gustavo and group out there, folks, everybody listening. They come to me and they say, I can't lose weight. The diet doesn't work. I, I follow the diet, the McDougall diet, strictly 100%. No. Usually, usually what I say is nothing. I say, well, you know, okay. Because there's, there's not, no reason to get in a fight about it. But then I'll come back once they settle down. And I'll say, well, most of the people I know, and including myself in the past, most of the people I know uh, had problems losing weight because they couldn't stay away from the oil. Oil, O-I-L, oil. Fat, animal fat, vegetable fat, oil. And uh, what happens is, is people uh, will go out to a restaurant, order a vegan meal, they'll come drowned in oil. Rather than sending it back, they'll eat it. Or they think, well, you know, a few tablespoons of olive oil in my salad's not gonna make a big difference. Or I'll just pick, I like this oily salad dressing better than the low fat one. Or, uh, or how about nuts? We, we kind of talked about that last time on the webinar. Nuts, you know, they're 90% fat. They're, they're very fatty. And, but it's vegetarian. It's vegan. You know, I, so what people need to do is they need to get the oil, the fat, out of the diet. Nuts, seeds, avocados, vegetable oil, wherever it is, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. If there's one mantra that I could keep everybody who wants to lose weight to put in their head, and every time they have a free moment, they go, the fat I eat is the fat I wear. The fat I eat is the fat I wear. If I eat that fat, it's going right to my hips. That's what's going to happen to them. I think that's the most important key thing to keep in mind. But then when you take the fats, the nuts and seeds and meats and oils and so on out of the diet, many people say, well, there's nothing, nothing to eat. Well, that's where the other mantra, so to speak, has to come in, and that is that you are a starch eater. You're a starchivore. You're a starchitarian. It's starch you have to get into your system to satisfy your hunger drive to run your machinery. It's sugar, sugar, uh, I'll say that dirty word, sugar. Starch is sugar. The body does not convert easily sugar into fat. Even if you eat extra sugar, it just dissipates in its heat. So what you need to do is you need to get the fats and oils out of your diet and you must get the starch in, absolutely must get it in. And this is another mistake that people make. I see all the time is they say, okay, okay, I'm going to stop eating the animals. I'm concerned about, the, you know, the cows with blinky, cute eyes. 
and the little pigs with their cute snouts. I'm not going to eat them anymore. I'm going to be a vegan. And I'm concerned about animal rights. I'm, I'm going to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be completely vegan, and I get that oil stuff. I get that oil stuff. I'm not going to eat that oil stuff. But I, but I want to be a vegan that eats a nutrient-dense diet. I want to be a vegan that eats really healthy vegan foods. And so they go to broccoli and kale and cauliflower. And they start eating these things. These are non-starchy vegetables. They don't have much sugar in them. They got you know, lots of proteins, lots of nutrients, lots of vitamins and minerals, but they're missing the sugar. And, and they try and live off broccoli. You know, it takes, it takes 11 pounds of kale to make 1,500 calories. It takes 13 pounds of cabbage. It takes about four pounds of potatoes to do the same. The volume of the food is just so great that when people go to these non-starchy, green, yellow, orange, red vegetable diets, they leave the starch out, thinking starch is bad for you. We, we, we could, we'll do a whole show on that sometime. They, they try and live off broccoli and kale and lettuce and celery, and they starve to death. So now here you are, you're back starving again, and you walk by that candy machine. You see that candy machine over there? You walk by that candy machine, it just reaches out and grabs you. You know, you're out of control. Uh, so that's, that's the other mistake I see. People who try, who believe in what I do and try and understand what I teach, that's the second big mistake they make. The first one, oh, let's put it in a different order. The first is they continue to eat the vegetable oils. The second is they go to the nuts and seeds and avocados, which are really fattening. They're not unhealthy, they're just fattening. Nuts, seeds, and avocados are, are healthy foods. They're just fattening. And then the next thing they do is they go to the non-starchy green and yellow vegetables, and, and they suffer all the way along. They say, I don't understand this. I'm different. My body's different. It doesn't work. Well, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. Of the 10 billion people who've walked this earth, more than 9.5 billion of them have lived successfully on starch-based diets. It'll work for you. You just got to get potatoes as 80 90% of your diet. Rice, 90% of the diet of people in China, Vietnam, Cambodia, 90% of the diet was rice up until 35 years ago. There were no fat people. Japan, you know, oh, oh, sumo wrestlers, sumo wrestlers. Well, look up the diet of sumo wrestlers, excuse me. They didn't need a diet based on rice. They have a special high fattening diet. Right. Right. So that's what you need to do. You need to get the oil out, the nuts and seeds and avocados out. You need to put non-starchy green and yellow vegetables like kale and broccoli and cauliflower as side dishes. That's where they belong. And you need to make starch the bulk of your diet. How much? 70%, 80%, 90%, 95%. You love pasta. You love potatoes. You love sweet potatoes. There's a reason you love these foods. They're your food. There's a reason you don't like broccoli. <laughs> Gail. No, I, uh, there's a, actually there's a last month's newsletter. We want to go read about, about the Scientific American article that talks about why people don't like these cruciferous vegetables. Right. Uh, there's a whole explanation. I'm not going to go into it, but anyway. Well, I think that doing a webinar, as you mentioned earlier, on starch, would be um, would be very helpful because there's so much confusion about that. Yeah. Um, I promise you, everybody listening to me, if, if the internet goes out right now, if you hear this message, <laughs> it was worth your trouble getting up and listening to us. Until you get starch as the center of your diet, you will be you'll be hopeless. You'll be helpless. You, it'll it'll never work for you. I, I've dealt with good grief. I've taken care of well well over ten thousand people. You know, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. You know, not only studying it, but you know, personally touching people, patients. I'm a doctor. I, I touch people. And, and I watch people struggle along, and uh, they kind of get it. I should be a vegetarian. I should be a vegan. They kind of get that plants are good for them. But somehow or another, uh, they, they keep fighting this idea of, it's right in the back of their mind. Someplace there's it really it's gotta be in the front of their mind. There's this thing that says, I'm not even gonna eat a potato. I'm not gonna eat rice. No matter how much how much sense it makes, no matter how much science they know, 
it, it just takes people months, sometimes years to finally get it. But I'll tell you something, once they get it, you know, once they get this start centerpiece, it's history. It's over. Yeah. It's not a problem anymore. Yeah. Unless, oh, yeah. unless they do what I do, Gustavo, did maybe 15, 20 years ago. They travel around and they're not perfect. <laughs> well, right. I mean, you, I, I appreciate it so much. And I know people appreciate it because, of course, you're Dr. McDougall. You're perfect. And, and it's, it's nice. I will, never, I will never die. <laughs> right. I can never die. <laughs> but, but traveling, for example, I travel a lot. It's, it's really, a, it's, it can be bad for you. It's hard to follow the diet sometimes. Um, and, and, and I appreciate that you mentioned that. Uh, Dr. Maduro, one, one more topic, if you would comment quickly, which is uh, for one of my issues is sugar. I am just addicted to sugar. Um, <laughs> I have been able to diminish that almost completely by eating, like you're saying, a lot of starches. But people are asking, um, uh, is sugar really the evil that that the media says that it is when losing fat. Is that really the, the problem, eating too much sugar? We, we should really do a whole show on that. But let me just tell you, this is where the low carbers have gone to take the focus of attention off the meat, primarily the meat and dairy. Right. This, this has been a strategy of, uh, of the low carb movement. Is uh, uh, The public is smart enough to figure out it's something they're eating that's making them sick and overweight. And so what uh, many of the low carbers have done is point, they pointed the guilty finger at sugar. Now, please listen to me carefully. Sugar is not health food. You know, white sugar, refined sugar will rot your teeth. It'll raise triglycerides in sensitive people. And it's empty calories. You know, there's no vitamins, minerals, protein, nothing. But sugar does not cause people to, to become overweight unless they mix the sugar with fat, and that's called ice cream. That's called pie. That's called cake. That's called candy bars. You see, that's where sugar gets you in trouble. It really tastes good, and they mix it up with this fat, and it causes you know a double whammy. The sugar raises your insulin, and the fat's there, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. But, but just feeding people plain sugar, it's, uh, very little sugar is converted into body fat. Uh, I'd have to say, I don't know of anybody, uh, you could prove me wrong. No, I don't think you could. Uh, if, if anybody can find a scientific paper that will show this, I'd be glad for you to email it to me. I, I can't think of any setting where somebody got fat, some, somebody got fat, I mean really fat, like, like the American size or European or Australian size fat. I can't think of any research that shows people getting fat eating sugar. You got to mix it up with the fat, the oil, the meat, and so on. Sugar is that, uh, you know, sugar is the way that, uh, that industry can get you to eat disgusting food. How many of you would eat boiled chicken? A raw chicken? Raw beef? I went to my favorite Mexican restaurant a couple of weeks ago, and they had McDougal beans and rice and right over the counter. And it stunk so bad I had to leave. Walk into your market today, walk down the meat aisle. The sights and the smells will make you nauseated. So how do you get people to eat innately disgusting food? Is you, you dose it with salt and sugar. So, no, you won't eat that raw chicken or even the boiled chicken, but you put some barbecue sauce on it, which is uh, sugar and salt, and you can get it down. You can't eat, get people to eat cheese unless you put salt in it. So, <clears throat> the sugar is the disguise that gets people to eat harmful things. Remember, I didn't say sugar was health food. But the reason that... Uh, Sugar is so associated with bad health. Well, the soda pops a problem. I mean, people drink a lot of soda, and that's not good. But the main thing is, is most of the sugar and salt that we eat are mixed up with salami and cheese and and uh, barbecue and and so on. That's the, the sugar is kind of there as an incidental small contributor 
shouldn't be the focus of attention. The low carbers have made it the focus of attention. People believe sugar is not health food. But, but, but people who are truly interested in the world, truly interested in their personal health, truly interested in their children, what they should be focusing on is the, is the livestock, the animal foods, you know, the cows and the pigs and the chickens and the vegetable oil. <clears throat> in, in the last 35 years, the dairy and meat consumption worldwide has doubled. The vegetable oil consumption has doubled. In Asia, the consumption of rice has decreased. In the last 35 years, uh, just take Asia, for example, people have gone from trim, no heart disease, prostate cancer, almost no breast cancer. I mean, really, no breast cancer. They, the people who ate the traditional diets had no breast cancer. 35 years ago, these things were unknown in parts of the world like Asia. In the last 35 years, because of fossil fuels, because of technology, because of the huge wealth that this world has been able to attain, transportation, etc. In the last 30, 35 years, we've gone from a situation where in China, before 1980, fewer than 1% of people had type 2 diabetes. Today in China, or actually two years ago they published it, 12% uh, of the Chinese had frank type 2 diabetes, and half the Chinese were pre-diabetic. There was just a report last week, I think it was, it was a JAMA, just, just this week, that showed about uh, 12 to 14 percent of Americans have now have type 2 diabetes and about half are pre-diabetic. So the whole world is going on the same, you know, on the same destructive path. So what, what, where I was getting to and what, what I want to end that, this particular note on is uh, there are a lot of people out there that are passing laws against sugar, that's good, and encouraging uh, fast food restaurants to sell only small sodas to their customers. I mean, all that's good. Don't get me wrong. People should not be eating sugar. Uh, but it's misplaced energy. You know, the, the, people are getting fatter and sicker and the planet is being further destroyed because nobody wants to face the reality what, what is really the problem. And the problem is, is the consumption of all these animal foods, the cows and the pigs and the chickens and the fish, Good grief, 90% of the fish are gone since I was a little kid. So unless somehow, some way, maybe one of you listeners out there has some somebody's ear, they could say, okay, okay, sugar's bad, we shouldn't be eating sugar, but excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, you've missed the elephant in the room. You've missed the problem. And the problem, it's, it's not an elephant. Well, maybe people eat elephants. You've missed the cow in the room. The problem is while we're out here really working hard against the sugar, people are forgetting the oil, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. They're forgetting all of the livestock and the, the ocean uh, that we're eating. And, and somehow or another with this distraction of sugar out here, we can't get uh, focused on what we really need to focus on to make a difference. Yeah. Right. Well, and wouldn't you say, Dr. McDougall, that that um, GMOs and uh, other topics like that are also a, dis, uh, a way to distract people? Yes, yeah. gluten-free diets and GMO. Mm -hmm. But that that's that's just a way to stop and ruin people's mornings. If I told them that <laughs> yeah. I've never seen a case of GMO disease or ever heard of one ever occurring in a human being ever, and the incidence of, of gluten problems is far fewer than 1% of people, yet 30%, 40% of the foods that are sold have a gluten-free label on them, and GMO is a big sales pitch. Yeah, again, you're right, Gustavo, thanks for bringing that up. It's, it's another way of distracting, of, of keeping our focus of attention off what needs to be dealt with, which is, again, I know you're getting tired of hearing this, the livestock and right. the vegetable oils. Um, our connection is slowing down. That sometimes your speech doesn't match your. Oh. Movement. I think it's probably better if we stop here and we pick up next Friday. Oh. Let's do that. It's a lot of fun, uh, folks. Uh, uh, I just want you to know that Gustavo went through an awful lot of work this morning to make this happen at all. Uh, he's uh, he's at the Flamingo Resort 
in Santa Rosa, where I am, where we're putting on the advanced study weekend. And I want to thank you for all your effort, Gustavo, to get this to happen at all for us. Oh, no. I'd love to, to get the word out. And thank you again, Dr. McDougall. This is a very busy, busy weekend, and I look forward to every second of oh, it. Oh, yeah. It's going to be a fun weekend. We've got, uh, of course, you can imagine how nervous, nervous I am having yeah. uh, the opportunity to host this weekend with all these, these great guests and wonderful people coming to, the, to Santa Rosa. I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, I'll better quit. Okay. We'll, we'll see you folks next Friday. And okay. if all goes well, if you tune in, we should tell them right now, Gustavo, if you ever tune in 7 a.m. Pacific time, Friday mornings or Saturdays, sometimes on Saturdays, we're not there. Sometimes technology gets the best of it. We apologize. Right. And uh, we'll send out notices and so on. Uh, so far, it's worked out well. Yes, very well. Well, thank you again, and thank you, everybody, for logging in. We'll see you next Friday, or maybe we'll see you here in Santa Rosa today. I'll, I'll see you at 5 o'clock this afternoon. That's right. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Okay, bye-bye.